right now, man. These are exciting times. And it turns out that what we're doing right now is, is like what everybody's going to be doing for the indefinite future. Man, I owned a lot of Zoom stock. Oh, and wow, did it freak. It's been doing great. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Jermaine, you were going to say something? I'm always going to say something. Don't I know, I know. You, you looked like you were just on that moment. Of... Probably. Yes. Congratulations. Hey, me, me, oh, it's just yeah, exactly. portfolio. By the way, <laughs> regarding the markets, fire, fire. Fire? They're on fire? Everything is okay? This no, is normal? Fire, fire. Get the hell out of the building. Get the hell out of the markets. It's okay. moment, like, is this a moment to go to cash? Just like? Yes, and gold. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, and I'm, I'm not being doomsday. The reason I want to go into gold is because the dollar is falling, and the yeah. Of, yeah, lot, the, when the, when OPEC did that thing, bye bye dollar. Like this is the end of the Imperium's dollar. It's really? going to be slow and steady. That's okay. That's a different conversation. But um, let me um, let me just say that this is the Rex monthly check-in call for uh, March. What the hell day is it today? Uh, Wednesday, Mar Wednesday, March eleventh. Uh, 2020. I don't know how we got there. Uh, and uh, I have a poem for us uh, titled Choices <clears throat> um, by Nikki Giovanni. And it goes like this. If I can't do what I want to do, then my job is to not do what I don't want to do. It's not the same thing, but it's the best I can do. If I can't have what I want, then my job is to want what I've got and be satisfied that at least there's something more to want. Since I can't go where I need to go, then I must go where the signs point, though always understanding parallel movement isn't lateral. When I can't express what I really feel, I practice feeling what I can express, and none of it is equal, I know. But that's why mankind alone among the animals learns to cry. Yeah. <laughs> Zoom video is up 3.8 today in the down market. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, if, if you had That's sold everything and only bought Zoom, you'd be doing great. Yeah. And, and it, it's been up 7% some days. Yeah. So what, and, you're saying, what you're saying, Bo, is that while Jerry was reading his very meaningful and deep felt poem, you were looking at the stock market. Something like that, yeah. I'm an addict, baby. I'm an addict. Okay. See the green one? <laughs> yeah, the green one. The green one is Zoom. <clears throat> That's very funny. And if, if you guys want me to talk about it, I've been just, I've been reading, I probably read 100 hours last week. And though I know that's not unusual for me, I've actually switched from Hegel a little bit to more to the stock market. To, uh... Uh, so I think, you know, I wasn't worried until the bond market crashed. Uh huh. The bond market is actually a much better signal of the economy than the stock market is. So are you yeah, saying gold, gold is the only safe thing right now, or are there other harbors? Oh, you know, cash is fine. It's just if you want a productive asset, uh, have 5% gold, 3 to 5%. Cigarette packs. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, not talking Cigarette about, packs. I'm not talking about doomsday prepper crap, because no, I'm talking about the investment. Because remember, I think gold in a real doomsday prepper situation would probably just get you killed, A. And B, you can't eat gold. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't eat it, so... It, it, but I, it's about the dollar going down. And uh, what I, I think part of what's behind Russia's and this conflict in OPEC, which, by the way, OPEC's dead, too. Uh, I need to put that on Twitter. That, that day, day that happened, that's the end of OPEC. I mean, yeah, the shell may remain, but its power is over. Hmm. Um, the other its thing, power's been over for a while, yeah. I mean, realistically. Yeah, we're, mm -hmm. we're definitely calling it on a body that's a little been a corpse for a while. Uh, <laughs> so it's been moldering. But I think another thing behind this, and this actually doesn't isn't key to my thesis, but I think Russia, you know, Russia really wants to destroy the dollar because this, you know, petrodollar thing, this having to do every transaction in dollars worldwide, yeah, uh, is, is, you know, it, it, it gives the America a great deal of power. I mean, we can essentially mess with anybody. And I've been wondering years ago. I was wondering why China didn't just stop buying our T bills. Like, like if they decided tomorrow to just not buy up all the T bills we'd be screwed but then they'd be screwed too but exactly. they're screwed right but they're screwed right now anyway so why not take advantage of the moment i don't um they, they'd screw themselves but it, uh, foreigners have already been uh, have 
have retreated from the treasury market already for quite some time. Yeah. yeah. And, so this, uh, this conversation is why man alone among the animals knows how to cry. <laughs> Which isn't true, by the way. <clears throat> uh, darn it. Who else cries? <clears throat> bonobos, bonobos, chimps, bonobos. gorillas, right. I think. All right. Damn it. They're all so close to us. We don't even realize it. Oh, no. Come on. We're special, Jerry. We're super yeah. special. Al alone among the animals, we can ruin the planet. There so you it, go. So the, stock, the, the bond market is really calling it. And that and when the bond market went down, that below 1% thing. Oh, 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 oh. So why is the bond market a better measure than the stock market? Uh, why is the bond market? Because the, the stock market is, is more um, prone to bubbles. And the stock and the, and the bond market's rate of return is, is, is a very great measure, good measure of the expected rate of the return on the economy. And when that rate of return gets below 1%, that's a prediction about the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The okay. German, the German uh, benchmark is like negative 1%. Yes. There have been, many countries have been in negative we, interest rate territory for a while. Japan, uh, yes. you know, almost us. And we've been an outlier. Our stock market's been doing great. Uh, you know, yes, negative interest rates in, in Europe and in Japan. Come on, Japan hasn't come back since when the market went down well, you know, a long time ago. In fact, economists stay at night worrying about us catching the Japanese disease. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, so, yeah, I'm, I... I I think the buy and hold thing is not exactly, and I don't really give advice. I'll just tell you what I'm doing. I was liquidating like crazy yesterday. Uh -huh. And I think that it's going to, it's a wiggle on an up days. I'll just be selling more. Uh, I, I'd say like an 80% probability that the, the uh, bull market is over. And uh, it's felt like I've been dancing on a bubble for a while anyway. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've been yeah. living greater fool theory. Um, <laughs> and, <clears throat> but you know, and I'm saying this when I know that we have a president, who will do anything to make sure this economy just go down? Look and for him to look for him to sell his children now, because he <laughs> will will do anything. Yeah. Um, but this is I've been reading a lot of Ray Dalio, and yeah, that guy Dalio's is smart. not a dummy. That, uh, yeah, he's not, a, he's, not, economics, he's you know, not a dummy. Economics degree and my economics study for ever since the '80s, you know, academic and otherwise. I've been reading. I, I bought his you know depth book, and I've just been reading it like a nut. And it's really good stuff. That guy, this, this is not bull. This is like, hmm, this is excellent. And what he describes the way debt cycles work, we're, that's one of the reasons interest rates have to go so low. We're, we have to like pay off the debt and the way to do that is to cheapen, uh, cheapen the currency. And, we, and it's always worked that way. And, and another way the cheap currency is being cheapened is uh, you know, the strong dollar, the strong dollar. So are, you a fan, are you a fan of MMT? Because I find MMT to be crazy making. <laughs> MMT for everybody is modern monetary theory. And it basically says, as far as I understand it, I'm an amateur here, that debt doesn't matter, really doesn't matter. What matters is sort of keeping the economy going, everything else. So just forget about the deficit. Well, you know, I love the way Ray Dalio talks about debt. So MMT, most of us are, what we're, we're okay with it because actually that's, the government did it in World War II. Uh, World War II is a little special, I will say. Um, and but what we worry about is that it gives car plus to politicians. Yes, exactly. Well, MMT is the perfect Anything. way to say it, it lets you like triple the military budget and not worry about it. Right. Like insane. Yeah. So you would find we economists are sitting there in a corner like, yeah, you could get away with it a long time. But the kind of yeah. kind of society you're going to build is going to be pretty frightening. <laughs> so the, the, the risk of MMT is that it's a moral hazard. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. Right. You got it. Well, I mean, it's funny because, um, as, uh, you know, if you've watched The Big Short or read the book, both of which I recommend, you know, uh, the instruments that everybody was investing in were crazy making instruments. And so the explosion was predictable if you'd been sort of sniffing the air as the six or eight people that are, that are profiled in the books uh, kind of did. But, but I'll just note that um, the market exploded, things went way down. And if you had bought it that low, and they just went chugga, 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 work, work their way back up to right now, to the peak that, that, you know, that is being popped right now. But, but there was this brief interim where, where things went down and they were cheap to buy. And I, you know, I wish I'd sold everything and just bought Amazon at that low. That would have been great. Would have been pretty useful. 
Um, but who does and who thinks that, you know, who thinks about these things? But, but the cycles are that the crashes are short and sharp and the, the booms tend, I think, to be longer. The danger is like this horrible Japan situation where you have stagnation. We had, we had briefly stagflation, right? Where mm -hmm. we sort of couldn't, couldn't get out from under inflation plus no, no growth. Uh, broke that. Reagan sort of breaks that. Uh, but I don't know. So I, I'm interested in whether we're catalyzing our way into a really different scenario. So first of all, uh, this thing about buying low, I'm really glad everyone else has that orthodoxy right now, and I'm fully going to take advantage of your naivete. It can take you up to 10 to 12 years or longer to get your money back. And whatever you may think how strong your fortitude is, when your portfolio's down 50% and you've got to wait, you could end up waiting almost two decades. Uh, so be careful about that, A. Yeah. Yeah, cool. uh, Can I ask a question? Because I, I don't want to, if, if the group wants to talk about uh, personal stock investment strategies, I'll check out. I'll go somewhere else. Um, that's not why I got on the call today. Um, I, you know, not everybody plays this, the market in any serious way. So um, uh, no disrespect intended, but I, I'm happy to pull out or, you know, steer the conversation you know, we're not going to keep going on about this no. and i was and i was happy i was letting this play out a little bit because it's it's like pent up but i would love to go to um other topics like how we're how everybody's dealing with coronavirus and whatever think, else I this is a check-in call so this was yeah. before we got into absolute dread <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah this is the happy part of the conversation yes. oh i yeah, see yeah. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so I, I, I just may it may amuse you that i was in a conversation maybe a month ago uh, with a woman and she said, you know, you'd be a good doomsayer. Um, and the doomsaying is kind of sexy these days. I'm like, oh, Jemay, right, good point. <laughs> and, so, and so I bought the domain, thedoomslayer.com. Yeah, so, so I think I'm gonna do a little bit of, of uh, like video or something or other as the doomslayer and see how that feels. But, but I just got off a call this morning. Uh, this, is, this is me by way of checking in. Um, I just got off a call this morning with a couple people that I may be doing more stuff with um, that made me realize that uh, my probably my big umbrella is Open Global Mind, which is always been my own sort of code name for what's after the brain. Like the brain is a proprietary tool. I'm their lead user and their most frustrated user. I've been envisioning like how could we make sense of the world together? Um, you know, what, what would be marginally one millimeter more difficult than Pinterest and Instagram and Snapchat that would let us express what we believe to each other and have better, you know, make more sense of the world together. Um, and that was for quite a while, mostly a techie vision of some, some new app or suite of apps or platform for apps or whatever. But I then realized recently that really it's all about norms and social change. And the conversation I just got off was, was about all of that and more and felt really, really, really aligning and good for me. So I, I need to chew on that and sort of uh, put it in motion. But I think that maybe for me for a while, the tent, the big tent for what I, everything I want to do is called Open Global Mind. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a convening place. So you can also expect invites to, to, to join stuff that, that sounds like Open Global Mind. And uh, I like the language partly because uh, it's about being open-minded. It's about acting openly. It's sort of global. It's got a whole bunch of virtues that I, that I like. Uh, Ken Homer pointed out that global sounds like globalization or globalism, and he prefers planetary. And I don't know, open planetary mind doesn't roll off my tongue very well. So that, that was an interesting, interesting bit of feedback. Hey, Susan. Um, and Esty, we think is on the call, but we don't see or hear her. Um, uh, she's muted, but uh, is there anyway. So th that by way of very brief uh, check-in for Hi, me. There's Esty. Hi, Esty. Um, so why don't we actually do a little, uh, a little check-in, just go around and see where we are, and then we can go into coronavirus or, or whatever else. Who would like to jump in next? I'm happy to jump in. Hi, Micha Sifri, um, working from my home office in Hastings on Hudson in New York. Um, I'm the co-founder of Civic Hall, uh, which is a five-year-old collaborative community center in Manhattan dedicated to the use of tech for the public good. Um, and uh, so my check-in is um, we just uh, decided uh, in consultation with our staff uh, that we would uh, close our physical space um, starting tomorrow night. 
um, for at least the next two weeks, uh, cancel all face-to-face -face events. Uh, our staff is going to work from home. We're going to, uh, the good news is that uh, the people whose jobs normally are to work with our members and and you know support collaborative events and workshops and so on are uh, leaning into uh, learning more about how you can do that virtually and do it well. Um, there seems to be a lot of uh, pent up demand for that all of a sudden. Um, and uh, the bad news is that I live about, I think four miles away from the containment zone <laughs> that uh, uh, wow. our, our very, very on the ball governor uh, has announced around this um, synagogue in New Rochelle, which apparently is an epicenter of spread. I don't really understand uh, uh, any of the public authorities' behaviors or actions so far because they're they're so sort of internally contradictory. Um, but uh, it's good that he's a man of action, I guess. Uh, though, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm seeing reports of um, uh, National Guard being called out in New York. Have you yeah. heard that? Yeah, no, that's the containment. The idea is that they're creating a one mile radius around this uh, synagogue because there have been such a cluster of cases. Um, and so what they're trying to do is uh, require people basically to avoid uh, any large gathering. Um, so schools are being closed. Um, you know, big shopping centers, I think, are being closed, though the places to get food and groceries, they say, are open. They're also saying the National Guard is going to deliver food to people. No idea how that's going to work. Um, but it's not a travel restriction, so you can get in and out. Yeah. Um, and this so is, they're saying it's not like Milan or <clears throat> now all of Italy. It, it's not like China. They're not blocking the roads. They're just trying to discourage mass meetings and you know movement in and out. Yeah. So it, I would call this a half measure uh, on on the way to something more serious. Um, the other thing that's going on here that's really interesting. My wife works um, at one of the City University of New York uh, colleges. There are twenty three of them. And the students at these, uh, uh, you know, colleges are typically working class and immigrant, um, and they are all freaking out because all the private schools are closing, mm -hmm. and they're like, "What about us? Why are you know Why aren't you taking care of us?" Um, so uh, you know, things are heating up, um, and I, and then the last thing is is that our stupid mayor uh, seems to think that we should still have the St. Patrick's Day parade Oof. next week, which typically gets two million drunk people. I, I mean, I. I can't imagine that wow. in the stand. <clears throat> we, can they but, just deliver green beer to people's homes instead? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Party at home, man. Come on. <clears throat> here's a six pack of green beer. Go to it. Uh, green beer, and then here's a punch in the nose. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I, since we sort of saw, yeah, something um, uh, Micah said uh, made me think of this. Um, you know, at, the discourse at a high level, as we know, it isn't really helping much, but. Uh, there ha there's been a lot of talk about moving from saying we can no longer treat it, um, at least in terms of the metrics, in terms of contagion, because we can't follow it anymore. Right. Um, but the response of um, uh, and and the con and the the next step, I guess, if it is one, is um, to think in terms of mitigation. Like right. how are we going to take care of people who are sick? That being the, <clears throat> that being the um, the place to to put our energies, and that being a very local. Um, a local need. Um, so all this energy that's going into shutting things down is going to flip the economy into complete chaos. Um, and uh, nobody's talking about that either. But I'd be interested to hear what... Um, okay, Jerry. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. Keep going. Uh, no, I was, I was just I was... Say, I'd be interested to hear what people think about that high-level contagion versus mitigation thing, and where is the discourse in the country if there is one, and what implications for what to do are there if we can't? Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll say three quick things about that. One is one is the danger appears to be um, that we flood the healthcare system and therefore people can't actually get treatment because it looks like ten to twenty percent of people need intensive treat intensive care. And I was just watching a video this morning. It's like holy crap, that's what happens. 
um, so they actually do need do need gear and devices and treatment mm -hmm. and, and so forth. There's, there's a bunch of things that have to happen in a hospital yeah. it, um, for the, for some ten at least ten percent of the cases, two percent of which or under two percent of which will probably die. Um, so so the the best advice I've heard so far is let's flatten the curve, yeah. which means let's not create a spike of cases <laughs> because a, a nihilistic friend of mine just yesterday said let's just have a chickenpox party, let's just get everybody together like mingle a lot. We'll cull the herd, like the people who are going to get it and die are just going to get it and die. And then we're done. Then we all have like antibodies and we're immune. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. But, <laughs> but it was done with a bit of tongue and a bit of cheek. The guy but who said that first is the guy who also kicked off the tea party. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Um, and then, and so <laughs> yeah. flatten, the, flatten the curve basically means let's do social isolation and let's do a bunch of measures so that we can reduce the contagion rate so that we don't overwhelm the system. But the third thing I'll say, and then I'll step away, is that this appears to be headed to being an endemic disease as opposed to a, just a momentary pandemic. And an endemic disease is anything that just becomes part of what everybody gets and has and we deal with. And then we wind up getting vaccines and treatment and, and all of that. But this becomes just like the seasonal flu, there'll be this, you know, the seasonal coronavirus will be, will be there as well, if, if in fact the thing is seasonal. Mm. Yeah, but this, this, this I mean, universities shutting down. Um, I mean, Harvard just shut down for the rest of the year, for instance. And yeah. um, Stanford's following suit, I guess. Um, and when you think of the... Um, okay, well, maybe this is a question for Bo. <laughs> so uh, when I think about this, I start to think, oh my God, think of the imbalance between the, the rich and the poor, that whole thing. And we have 44% of the people living hand to mouth in this country. And if they can't work, which many of them will not, because everything that they do is being shut down. Yeah, um, right. And I'm not, I'm exaggerating, I, but what, would should, what are the alternative things that we should be doing about that? So our big, big, big problem is this charging for testing it, bad. Next problem, people can't stay home, I mean, there's something like 12 states actually have like you get sick leave, the rest don't. Most of these Americans have three days of sick leave. Yeah. And believe me, you're right, Susan, The Economist, The Financial Times, that's all we're talking about is, yeah. my God, how can we mitigate when these people, they don't have the money <laughs> to do it. And, so that, you know, the and it's gonna be very soon, right? And ironically, the moment when Bernie, it looks like Bernie needs to drop out of the race is the moment we need Medicare for all Et cetera, yeah. et cetera, because everything Actually, Bo just said the odds of getting it go up without Bernie in the race. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Please repeat oh, that, Nika. The odds of us getting this go, getting Medicare for all go up without Bernie in the race. That's true. And why don't we stop using that word? What, which, which word? word? Race? All? Uh, Medicare for all. <laughs> <laughs> which word? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, as far as economic growth this year, um, not going to be much of it. And I don't think anyone's actually even concerned that much. <laughs> and I hope everyone really understands what the Chinese did. It wasn't just locking down a city. They tested, 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 isolated, tested, 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 isolated. And it's just, a, it's, a, it's embarrassing that the CDC's first test didn't even work. Yeah. I mean, wow. And uh, then they then they said they couldn't. Well, we've been we've been decimating all these services, haven't we? Yes. yes. Nobody yep. nobody uh, respects expertise. So the pandemic emergency group was shut down by Trump yes. about six months ago. So just to ask, is no one, there no any, one would have there... thought that this might happen? Of no. course not. Well, Obama thought it might happen, so that's a bad thing. Uh, well, are the people who did the simulation of District 201 or whatever it's called, or Event 201, where they pretty much simulated what's happening today, right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, transmissible disease in a, in a simulation a couple of years ago. Uh, let me ask, um, does this spiraling downward doom Trump's re-election? Yes. Yes. Because, yes. People vote their, because, because people will vote their pocketbooks or because people will discover that, oh, damn, we actually needed the healthcare system I that these crazy Because half his voters are going to die off. Yeah. I'm with Susan. Oh, good. Remember, Susan, you missed it. Um, Sorry, I, I, don't, ahead, I think the economy is fatally weakened. And I think the bond market uh, has signaled that we're going to go into a recession, highly likely. Yep. And that is not going to be good for Mr. Trump's election. It yeah. will be very bad. And it, so you, and it will go fast enough. This it's is gone really fast. 
Uh, Does it count if it's not an, if there's no election? Oh. Hey, Todd. Yeah, no, there so, might not be one. That's true. <laughs> it, it, well, no, imagine, the, the, imagine, the, the, imagine a Trump campaign with no rallies. No, but he's going out and shaking hands with everybody. Well, yeah. we can only hope. Yeah, he's probably going to get sick, um, as as well might Biden, and you know, oh, yeah. yeah, who knows? Yeah. Let's see. What is the most vulnerable age segment? Oh, right, people running for office. <laughs> Oh, old white guys, that's who. Old white guys running They're for office, already, that's it. I, I think it's six members of Congress oh. who are self-quarantining. It's not funny. Yeah, and, the, UK's, and I, the UK I'm Secretary of Health. So we were doing a brief check-in and we made it as far as Mika. Uh, <laughs> any, anybody else want to go? Me and uh, Mika and I both went. Who else would like to jump in? Just like, where are you and what's up for you and how is all this affecting you? Um, well, I'll jump in. Um, I'm still at home. I work at home. So this actually, in terms of my day-to-day -day life, hasn't really been a big, a big uh, modification. Janice works at UC Berkeley in the Biosciences Library, appropriately enough. And um, UC Berkeley has, has not shut down, but has converted to all classes that can be virtual in any way are now virtual. Um, there are some labs and phys and you know, any kind of athletics that's still done in person with some modification. But uh, they're now talking about essentially um, shutting the libraries down to students, but the library staff will still have to come in. Uh, so, well, you know, there's not a lot of stuff you can do as a library worker and there's <laughs> um, remotely and there's a lot of stuff they can get done and they don't have to deal with students at the same time. Um, so she's not entirely miffed at that. And uh, the commute's a lot better now. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, yeah, one, one, of the, one, of the, one of the benefits of the apocalypse, yeah, commute, the commute's great. Um, yeah, we're, parking is so easy now. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think the only difference is that it's given a kind of a, um, more of a, biological twist to my to my apocalyptic conversations um you know i'm and not what, and uh, what could be wrong about that oh no um everyone needs a little biology now and then yeah um no it's it, just for me it's been kind of fascinating watching a scenario play out uh you may jerry you may remember that in 2008 iftf did something called superstruct I loved that. That was a. It was. It was Jane McGonigal's design game. It was brilliant. It was. I, I, Jane I think McGonigal a, and me. <clears throat> oh, that's right. I um, wrote it, the it, scenarios it, for it, and yeah. That's right. So, and it was all about a Sorry global about pandemic called. We called it Reds Respiratory Distress Syndrome. <clears throat> exactly, and it was a. It was a high point for IFTF, I think. Yeah. And, you know, Jane's talking about doing a a new one, which is you know obviously good, um, but it's something that you. Know, we, you mentioned other people doing workshops and scenarios about pandemic. This is something we have been thinking about. And so when I say it's a scenario playing out, I'm not being entirely facetious. Yeah. All facetious, really. Um, but one of the things about scenario thinking is it's always about looking down the road of what happens if, what happens next, and how do these things combine? Um, you know, so that's where I get worried about things like... Um, election uh, election uh, delays um, and at the same time recognizing that there's a there remains a a the, the deep state such as it is the the permanent the, the permanent state remains and will not you know there's a strong resistance to the idea of um, making kind of major changes anti non-constitutional changes within the government itself so this actually when i talk about the idea of uh, an effort to delay the election what that's talking about is the potential for a, an internal war within the government oh wow yeah I an thought internal about war within the military <clears throat> Jesus. and i i learned recently that actually uh, the president despite being commander-in-chief cannot fire a general what <laughs> it's actually, it's, um, he can reassign a general. Really? But it's uh, actually the House of Representatives has the authority to hire and fire generals. I did not know that. Okay. Um, and so I was before, I had to <clears throat> double check that, but that's always formed by yeah. somebody I usually trust for these kinds of things. That's um, really interesting. And so 
you know, the Trump reassigning generals that have been the you know, joint chiefs and have been the leaders of major bases, um, there is a, you're trying to bring in the loyalists, there's a real potential for an internal conflict. Yeah. Hopefully just <clears throat> administrative and, you know, strongly worded letters. Yeah. Uh, you know, the entire breadth of government in the U.S. And that's kind of terrifying. Well, it's so, <clears throat> yes. Um, I guess my question is something like, um, uh, d well, here's the qu first question that came to mind. So has, has the military used to do tremendous planning and tremendous scenario, you know, very, very, very big, big things. Mm -hmm. Where are they on things like this, like a, an endemic or pandemic situation like this? Anybody know? I don't know for certain. I do know that a lot of the um, scenario and wargaming work around um, controversial <clears throat> topics has been have been shut down. Yeah, things like uh, gaming out uh, climate change related stuff, for example. And um, I'm not. I'm not up to speed on what the military is thinking now, but I've, I've occasionally been <clears throat> through different projects. And from my experience, military intelligence, take that phrase for whatever you want it to be, goes up and down like a freaking roller coaster. Sometimes they do really brilliant things and they're like completely on top of their game. And sometimes they're stupid like rocks. And so one example of this is uh, uh, John Boyd, one of my favorite military minds. Who, was, uh, who invented the OODA loop and a bunch of other stuff and is the reason we invented the F-16 jet fighter, which is basically a rocket with a human sitting on top. <clears throat> and what we have now in the Raptor, like the F-22 and the F-35, <clears throat> Boyd must be spinning in his grave because these are stupid, expensive aircraft, like insanely expensive aircraft. I, and Jermaine may have a different, I'm interested in your opinion on these things because they seem as non-Boyd as I can imagine. Like vertical oh, yeah. takeoff, seriously? Yeah, um, there is. They're too expensive to be to be useful in an actual con conflict yeah, yeah. because you can't you don't want to lose that much money by having one blown out of the sky. And as we learned, got in um, in the Balkan in the Balkan intervention, just because it's stealth doesn't mean it's invisible. Right. Right. So, um, and I'm, and I'm, we're digressing from a check-in round, but. Um, but I just want to say that the military occasionally is brilliant and occasionally is dumb like rocks. Um, a small thing, at the beginning of World War II, the, Amer the US military is almost worthless. It's terrible. Yep. It's, it's completely hierarchical and blind like a, like a blind animal. And the German military that Hitler inherits is one of the world's best militaries ever. Like, like the reconstituted German military after World War I is very, very, very intelligent. And so he, get, he gets, he picks up um, brilliant military minds. Um, anyway, let's go back to the check-in round, already in progress. <laughs> uh, Esty, it, we see your silhouette. You've adopted a very generic kind of shape. Yes, I've decided to experiment with perhaps being genderless. <laughs> oh, I like it. it. It is kind of a gender fluid avatar. Good point. <laughs> gender fluid visual. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, that and the fact that I'm in PJs and, you know, <laughs> etc. Um, uh, I think some of the, you know, uh, I can echo a few things. One is uh, Micah, I think, I want to talk about the real, the, what we're really learning. So, about social systems in this regard and realizing that you're in New York and in that whole area. So I'm posting that I want to hear us on that. Um, like Jermaine, my life hasn't changed uh, all that much, except that I believe that I'm in the highest risk group. And what I'm hearing from, because of underlying, because my mom smoked like a fiend, uh, uh, prenatal and and for the first eight years of my life so it's it's interesting and what i'm hearing is that those who get sick get really sick really quick about two weeks post uh, up to two weeks post infection uh so it's a it's interesting nothing's happened i think two weeks from now we're going to be in an entirely different shit show wow. um 
I right. Agree. <laughs> Certainly in the Bay Area, Seattle, where my son lives, and yeah, New York yeah. environs, right? And we don't even and know what's coming. And then I would just point out that a lot of what we've been, quote, discovering, it's really about viruses, is the way viruses are. And before this particular virus showed up, the whole fear of novel coronaviruses is that there is no immunity. And and so it has to, it will go everywhere and, and et cetera. So bottom line, I feel like we are seeing in the starkest possible terms, the effect of the idiot in chief um, in, in office. So I can't, I, I, I feel like I and several other people, including the doctor who, with whom I had an appointment yesterday, coincidentally, will lose all faith uh, in our system if he gets reelected. <laughs> um, because, yeah, anyway. So that's, since we're, we're doing views of the situation, um, those are mine. Um, and I will um, kick off the return to discussing social structures by saying that um, the synagogue in New York happens to be a modern Orthodox synagogue. I happened to be at Shabbat dinner last Friday with a family that um, belongs to the Palo Alto mo uh, modern Orthodox synagogue. Mostly people I didn't know, but at the table, there were 20 people, which included a bunch of kids. Um, one was like went to high school with the, the patient zero in that community. Yeah. And, you know, two others, et cetera. And the point is a dinner for 20, right? And, and these things happen. This is a community that actually is a community of the sort that many of us in this group have um, become infamous for promoting, right? Um, or, uh, and um, uh, anyway, so we're seeing, we're, we're, we're revealing a lot of social patterns, not just return to Zoom, right? And uh, so all of that's interesting. Um, period, carriage return, new paragraph. I can say that to this group, right? With the appropriate clunky noises. Mm -hmm. Then you get into, um, you know, uh, people being terrified of Asians and other forms of, uh, ethnic objection. Oh, yeah. I'll end there. <laughs> There's just so much on the table here. It's really like, like this conversation is turning over stuff that I hadn't quite thought about. For example, as you were talking, the pandemic everybody is going back to, to compare this one to, is the 1918 Spanish flu, uh, which was pretty lethal, partly because it was very contagious, blah, 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 blah. However, I read an article a couple of days ago where it was listing sort of uh, ancient pandemics and different kinds of, of things. And it included um, something that I had, I knew about, but what mentally I was not including it in that list, which is when Europeans hit uh, North and South America and when Europeans hit Australia, the, the native populations by some estimates are reduced by 80 or 90%. Exactly. 80 or 90% or die off. Of, lo of indigenous Americans and indigenous Australians, um, which is worse than the Spanish flu by a lot, um, worse than the bubonic plague. Bubonic plague gets rid of a third of Europeans. Uh, and there's a really nice book, uh, The Years of Rice and Salt, in which the premise is, what if the bubonic plague had killed off all Europeans? Then, then it leaving only Asia, Islam, et cetera. It's an interesting um, piece of science fiction by Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, anyway, I, I had never mentally put but do we know that there wasn't plague all over the world? I uh, don't know. I don't know how far it reached. I haven't come back. But, but I'm just saying that I, ha I have not put those particular biological incidents in the same list as right. these influenzas. This is immunology, right, 101, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and so really what we're dealing with here is an ignorance and a denial of biologic fundamental physiology, right? 
equivalent to the denial of climate science. I mean, there isn't, there, there isn't anything surprising in what's, what's happening here, except the complete unpreparedness of... And uh, lack, of, lack of belief or agreement or cooperation among multiple parties. So, and so and lack of imagination. To that end, a, a question, what will... I, I, would, I would disagree because dismantling the preparedness put in place, right, which happened, as far as I'm told, the dismantling of the federal ecosystem happened th three years ago as Trump came in, right? That's, uh, people knew and there were, you know, issues of how, how the U.S. economy copes with the economic fallout, mm -hmm. right, a aside, right? The fundamental, what, what will happen? What does it mean? How do you prepare for it has been known for, actually for decades. There's not even, right, you don't even need 21st century immunology, right, to immune science to understand what's going on here. And yet we're just beginning you know, I don't know how yeah. many people saw the curve of delaying incidents versus allowing it to, right, rise. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The fact that it took someone, I mean, it's lovely, it took someone drawing that curve, right, to everybody going, all, all the educated people I know, including my kids going, of course, now I get it, right? Yeah. This happened last week, right? Um, I'm sorry. Jermaine, Jermaine, you were going to jump in there? I was just wondering what the anti-vax movement, how, th how that group is going to respond. How are you they know, doing? Yeah. If and when and a vaccine becomes available, a year out, year and a half out from now, uh, will the anti-vaxxers refuse it? Or will, because of the threat, you know, the uh, evident threat of, the, of COVID, will they essentially hand wave away and say, well, this, is a, this one is okay? Right. Um, Conversely, well, what should what should our policies be? Should we say, <clears throat> should we take advantage of that and say only people who have demonstrated a willingness to get vaccinations previously right. um, get they get first first pass at the COVID vaccination? You're reminding me of that that uh, tweet that went around virally from the Flat Earth Society saying blankety blank is a global phenomenon, and somebody had circled global and said, "Aha, see." <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I think one of the, the outcomes that could, ha could happen also, as long as we're talking about those, is the, um, is the fact that the virus itself could mutate. Yes, it, and it, it, it does. It already has. And, uh, and, and, and become more or less innocuous in some places, mm -hmm. um, in which case, and if that happens before November, well. Yeah. I had not been contemplating the idea that the November election might be postponed. That had not entered my brain yet, and that scares me a bit. Like, oh crap, you're right. There could be a civil war within the government. And, well, and they could... civil war all over this country. Or yeah. we say, or we say uh, Congress uh, mandate vote by mail now. Uh, the existing frameworks exist in every state to do it because we already deliver absentee ballots yeah. to people who request them. So Oregon is a vote by mail state. I love it. Yeah, There's no so, problem with it. So the answer to that problem is move to vote by mail. Yeah. Um, it, it, this is not a hard one. Love that. Thank you. It is if you don't want to, if you want to make sure that the vote is limited to people that only the people that you want to vote. Oh, sure. I mean, extent, well, there is that. You know, yeah. Protecting. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Preventing gr certain groups from voting has been part of the Republican um, we have traditions <laughs> mandate for years. This yeah. is America. Um, we're slowly making our way through a check-in check round. Lose um, your legitimacy if you don't have an election, which well, I think that, they still want. Even if it's an election, they want an election that they know they're going to win, right. not the failure to have an election at all. Yeah, that's true. Um, but But I don't know that they're... I think, I think Trump is ballsy enough to slip into the limbo land of we're postponing the election. I think he's, that's, not, that's, a, that's a thing he's perfectly happy to do. Yeah. Although I agree with what you just said. But I mean, everybody heard the term illiberal democracy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So we think we live in a liberal democracy. Illiberal democracy looks like democracy, smells like it, but in fact is not a functional democracy. They have because... elections in Russia, right? Right, exactly. Because no, the, North the Korea election... has elections. Exactly. Uh, and they have judicial systems and they have the press. It's just that none of them are actually functioning the way they're supposed to. Uh, who else would like to check in? Please, Susan. I would like to. Please. I'll try to make it short. Um, yep. Yes. Well, in a, in a, um, in a fit of civic um, something or other, I, I signed up to be an enumerator in the census. Excellent. And, um, and then I thought, oh, my God, I probably should write about that as I'm doing it. <laughs> but I think it's a, it's a very interesting time to be doing it. Um, and, is it actually uh, going to happen? Are you going to be walking door to door? Because given coronavirus, well, are they gonna, is it going to dent the census? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they have to be thinking about it and it will be interesting, right? For sure. So, I mean, they have moved to get, try to get everybody, as many people as possible to do it online yep. and to only go see those people who haven't. <laughs> and, um, I have digital, no security, I digital security that. people are terrified by that. Yeah, yeah. This is a, oh, it's cool. a weird moment. Right. And, um, well, it wouldn't make voting any easier either, would it? So, um, anyway, I just wanted to say I did that. So, um, and um, the other thing is I, I have been following this whole thing for a couple of years on conversation, uh, conversational interfaces for lack of a better term and or conversationally informed as I would say uh, interface design um, and wanting it to become more informed by the by all of the work that's going on in all the various disciplines um, and suddenly in the world I'm thinking well is this really important to do now I think that's the kind of reaction <laughs> it's so strong what's going on that one has to ask oneself you know where do I put my energies and my time the, um, anyway, so I had had uncovered and have been invited to join uh, something called SeedToken.io or, or Seed itself, uh, which is a, a startup, which I think is that, well, never mind. I won't tell you what I think. Um, as to build a community of people who would, would actually sort of uh, host that kind of information and have those kinds of conversation because it really is being kind of run by techies. It's a, it's a open source, uh, open source kind of a effort to, to collect up um, the various um, bots in particular um, that people are designing and to try to, you know, build a, it's, it's everything in one bucket, uh, build a blockchain, uh, setting so tokens things people will exchange tokens blah 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 and and I can understand how it's supposed to work but it's unclear to me that they have a value proposition for um, the people who the people who are actually writing these things um, which is what they desperately need then so um, I just wanted to put that out on the table but it's an interesting play and and absolutely worthwhile to try so I'll, I can keep you posted. <laughs> would, love to, would love to know more about that over time. Sounds really interesting. I'll go look. Yep. Okay. And uh, the other thing is, well, that's it. I mean, I have, I have uh, a woman here who's from, originally from Russia. So she's known to my Russian renters and she's, um, I'm, I'm learning a lot from these people, I have to tell you. Um, and it's like, I don't have to travel. The world comes to me. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> it is. It really is true. So uh, anyway, we have a, a young woman who is stranded here, had come back from China where she was working to marry her husband, who was uh, who's Austrian but lives in Canada, and she's Russian, and then got stuck because she couldn't go back to China. And so she's here. Um, and, uh, you know, life goes on. Somehow life goes on. It's like um, Shakespeare in Love is one of my favorite movies. And when the owner of the globe is, you know, has his feet over the coals or whatever, and he's asked, how, like, What's, how's it going to work? I, I don't know. It's a, it's a miracle. Yeah. Somehow it happens. The show yeah. goes on. Uh, Todd, Dave, Bo, want to check in? Oh. Yeah. Yo. Hey, Todd. Check in, man. It's been a long right. time. Yeah. All right, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, I was supposed to be traveling right now, 
I didn't think I would be on this call this afternoon, but as has been happening, everything is getting canceled left and right. Um, so it's, it's an interesting predicament because um, on one hand, I, I feel the, the social distancing can actually create more intimacy. Uh, we're in this together. Um, people seem to be reaching out with the need to connect. Uh, people are looking for community, for security right now. And a lot of people I know, uh, including myself, are wondering, huh, what could our income look like three or six months from now? And so that is, um, you know, from everything from my, my daughter who waits tables at a high-end restaurant um, to people who own their, their own small business, and perhaps a lot of that is, is done in person or it's retail. So that's been on my heart. The other thing I'll mention for this group is after working for about six months with a um, small group, officially launched a nonprofit last week called the Fierce Civility Project. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll have a website up here uh, by tax day, by April 15th. And I, I feel very strongly as, as a, you know, I'm further left than progressives are, and it comes back around to a, an ability to suspend our points of view and have conversations and see the humanity in each other. And so our hope is that with this nonprofit, uh, we're going to build alliances with other nonprofits that are also doing bridge building work and offer tools and experiences uh, for people to see the humanity on the other side. Um, and some of you know, having grown up in a Republican family and having been a, uh, a college libertarian, <laughs> I just laugh when I think about all this. Uh, and my own migration of my belief system over years, uh, I, I can understand the principles on which real other belief systems exist. What I don't have a tolerance for is uh, despotic misdirection, power grabs, that's not about principles whatsoever. Uh, so that's, that's the short of it for me here in, in Michigan where um, you know, we had our first two cases of COVID-19 declared overnight. There's nothing in West Michigan and it's life is normal, except I was at City Hall to vote yesterday. And I was at City Hall this morning to protest a tax assessment and there's no handshaking going on anywhere. Uh, so interesting that that even comes here into rural America in which, um, you know, we're, we're, we're far, we're at least 200, 200 miles from the nearest known. Um, Liberal? <laughs> <laughs> so what's your favorite alternative to handshaking? Yeah, I've discovered that finger guns actually work really well. Finger guns, I like it. It's a little, it's a little military, but I like it. Yeah, I've been doing jazz hands. Um, Elbow. How about the doing kids? a bump? Uh, a, bump, a little a little butt bump. Yeah. Oh, that's that's creative. The kids, um, just watching the kids walk around town here, they're doing the uh, the the ankle, the hokey ankle. pokey. They're doing the hokey pokey. Do they turn themselves around? <laughs> it's cute. It's dinner, adorable. At the dinner, I mentioned everyone was already doing the Japanese bow. Then the nam namaste also, yeah. Yeah, exactly, with, with hands, yes. Yeah, but either just the bow or the namaste is nice. Uh, uh, there's yeah. the, Ebola, the Ebola elbow bump. Yeah, it's kind of crazy times. Thank you, Todd. That's, uh, can you keep us informed and send us links when you do the Fear Civility Project and all that? Because that sounds awesome. Will do, yep. Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, Dave, do you want to check in? Hi, everybody. I'm sorry I'm so late. Um, 
it's my well that's my check-in is i've been spending a lot of time on david hodgson's latest uh gig of the global regeneration collab and uh so you know it's like this whole coronavirus thing gets me i'm just like stay at home and do exactly what i've always done so it works perfectly for me um but uh, you know, it's really interesting to me to play with this idea of like, what does it mean to have a social network, and you know, is there a is there a network of networks, and how does you know how do you make that work? Um, a kind of an infrastructure layer, but then also just exciting about to see people working on genuinely regenerative projects that um, have scale and potential, and you know, they're optimistic, and you know, so I'm spending a lot of my day on very very positive kinds of things that have a lot of uh, you know, it's like the world could look like that and it would be much better. So, uh, so, so today's call was, you know, a guy that's trying to get funding for a project in Mexico that would take a, you know, a seaside desert and turn it into mangrove plantations and, you know, food forests and things. And it's like, so oh, yeah, yeah, that would be better. So yeah, yeah. let's do that. Yeah. And that's fun, fun work and for these times. So it's good work for these times. Yeah, exactly. That's lovely. And the whole regenerative everything world, I like, how do we draw more attention to it? How do we, you know, make people figure this out? Um, I was at uh, Visioneering last year, November-ish, which is the X Prizes annual conference where they basically, they get a lot of wealthy people to go brainstorm how to save the world and cre create new X Prizes. Then they get them to commit a bunch of money to fund those X Prizes, which is basically X Prizes business model. They, they like, they live off off those funds it's pretty interesting but what what really grabbed me was that the runner-up project the one that i wish had won was totally about regenerative ag and it um i was part of the birth of that that particular idea but but it was um it got me thinking hard that regenerative ag fixes so many things right it, it has all these positive uh, uh side effects that it should be on everybody's lips. Everybody should be out there trying to implement it wherever they can. And, and they're not, um, because the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to make enemies of the fertilizer and pesticide sales guy who's your neighbor, uh, you know, uh, downtown and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah. It's, it's the, grazing pe the grazing people and the vegans are already having fights in the street. So yeah. That's, awesome. I thought we'd be able to avoid all the battles, but it doesn't work out that way. It doesn't but work it, that way. Yeah. You know, I, I did read. I did read through Hirsch's book on political hobbyism, and and I, um, you know, totally self-identified as a political hobbyist. You know, oh, that's exactly what I do. I'm totally useless in politics and follow it like a sport. And then it's like you get to the <laughs> end of the book, and it's like he gives these recommendations. It's like these is, these are useless recommendations. You know, it's like he's kind of saying he's saying like we 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 watch we we do politics like we're watching football, and so yeah. we should actually go play. It's like, well, I'm not gonna go play fucking football. You know, it's kind of like, and if I did, I'd be like water boy or something. Like that. Like, go, this is a lousy, anyway. So I, that, which led me to the idea that there must be some concept of regenerative politics that we need to inject into our system. But you know, you can't going to play the game as it's played today doesn't make sense. So you have to change the game. So, so, so Mika, is there a regenerative I politics? In politics, Dave. So, sorry again, Mika. I couldn't disagree with you more. I think Eitan's book is excellent, and the advice it gives, which is to, to which is to organize locally uh, and organize people, which is the thing that's been hollowed out for the last couple of decades, um, is great advice. And yeah, would, it, but it doesn't suit me, and I don't think. I mean, he he was right that there's a group of people that are hobbyists, but telling them they shouldn't be hobbyists isn't enough. Actually, we need a bigger menu of political interventions. In fairness to the book, because I really like it and I have a review of it coming out soon in the American Prospect. Um, he did a survey of Americans uh, in 2018, one third of whom said, yeah, I'm politically active. And then when he asked them, well, how would you describe how you're politically active? 80% of them said, well, I spend uh, between an hour or two a day uh, keeping up with the news and commenting and sharing about it. And so what he is trying to say is that's not going to change anything. If you're interested in change, you actually have to be serious about organizing and having a strategy for winning power. The people who are serious about winning power, actually, they've been doing that for the last couple of decades really well. Mm -hmm. and, and I would argue, Mika, that that may be defined as, ex the, hypothetically, right? right? That's extractive politics. 
right? It's non-regenerative politics. So what would regenerative politics look like? Fine, organize for that. Um, the, it's the, these these two parties are uh, pretty uh, open for grabs, as Trump just showed us. And Dave, I love your question. I think we can sort of go with that maybe in a future call. But what would a regenerative politics look like? Because for me, politics is has become a consumer mass marketing exercise. That's sort of all it is. We consumerized it. And, and, and when I talk about this, I usually talk about big G government and small G governance. And big G government has become politics. It's become very politically driven. And it's, it's again, a consumerized game. Little g governance is maybe, maybe what you're talking about, about regenerative politics. So for me, regenerative politics is an oxymoron. Um, but regenerative governance is what I wish we all were doing, which is a, a polycentric governance and all, you know, devolving power as close to commons as possible, blah, 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 blah. And I'm not even, I, have, I haven't begun to think through what the implications of it are. I would love to think through what the implications of that are. And, right, I think and, Go ahead. No, no, I was just to say that um, one way of cutting through that knot is to recognize that what we call politics tends to be partisan disagreements or partisanship. Politics is the essentially the, the, pra the practice of resolving disagreements more broadly. You have, you have limited resources, limited, you know, limited set of power, and you have multiple people who want that, those resources or want that power. The way, the way in which you figure out how that gets shared or not, that's politics. Yeah. At, so maybe, you know, so maybe, I need to, maybe I need to add to my thesis, what would a little p politics look like? Right. What would nonpartisan like part, non politics look like? Yeah. <clears throat> well, in the regenerative world, the thing that I get the most excited about is, is you know, negative sum versus positive sum or zero sum versus positive. Yeah. I do feel like most of our politics is zero sum at best. It's oh, the value right. capturing. So it's, it's a political structure trying to capture value. How do you change that? Yeah. I was just wanting to point out that uh, sitting here where I do in between Silicon Valley and the ocean, um, I, I've been interested in watching the, the local stuff play out. And I mean, hyper local, right? Like, you know, the school in Half Moon Bay and uh, other, other things around, around the neighborhood as it were. And fire, fire prevention on your hill. And fire prevention, oh, yeah, oh, God. Uh, like that. We're, like so, that we're, so, we're getting very organized. This, or, this hyper-local organization seems to me to be expanding quite rapidly, and uh, it's pretty much self-organization. And I, I think, so, you know, I don't know how we, how we track it, but my, my sense is it's just gone up. Um, and the level of discourse about... Well, I've really appreciated the COVID discourse on Jerry's retreat, <laughs> which seems to be one of the one of the more long lasting and more thoughtful ones that we've had. Um, the but but here in you know where everybody things online and I do read all the little local little local rags um, that I can, um, and I'm hooked into two of the communities, three of the communities here. I, I just want to reiterate that it's it's. People are talking about it. You go into the grocery store, the other day I was in the grocery store and there were people standing there looking at the, the piles of uh, you know, hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide and they say, oh, they're out of uh, sanitizer. And then somebody says, well, we're supposed to make our own. Well, how do you do that? And it's just that, and I'm not surprised that you know, in Western Michigan, <laughs> I'm not surprised that in Western Michigan, people are, are not shaking hands. I mean, this stuff spreads even to, even to the hinterlands, very very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, in small in small group theory or whatever it's called, small world theory, I guess, like one person touching another group is, is like is enough to sort of yeah. include that group. So yeah. so you only need you only need a little it's bit of the virus, and, isn't it? and something that that incubates for a long time because if if it immediately kills you, it kills its host and you're done. If it has a nice long incubation period where you can't tell somebody is, is contagious, that is the worst possible kind uh, uh, of, of fiend, of biological fiend to, to encounter. And that seems to be what we've got here. Well, all the kids who are being sent home from college now. Yeah, they're gonna, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly, and, they're gonna take it back, to, back home. Yep. Mm -hmm. Vectors, interesting. And the Republicans <laughs> are 10% less likely to believe the public health authorities than Democrats right now. 
according to a poll that came out a few days ago. Right. Less likely to wash their hands, all that shit. Well, you, you know that this, this whole thing, coronavirus, is just impeachment part two, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, there was a Fox News host just said that. You know, yes. I, I, saw, I saw the same article. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. One, one, one of the hosts on Fox News said, this yeah. is basically a, a, a liberal plot to impeach the, you know, it's, <laughs> this is a follow-on from impeachment. This is a, an attempt to remove Donald Trump. That's wow. what this is. A lot yeah. of old white Republicans are going to die. Yeah. That sounds awful. Yeah. Let's, come on, everybody. Let's keep our humanity. I'm trying to, I'm struggling to hold back the tears. I did not respond to that, and I certainly thought about it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Ah. Um, Bo, do you want to check in? Oh, you sort of checked in at the start. Like you, you, you. Yeah, but most um, people weren't here. Um, yeah. I, I put some stuff in the chat, um, the, the, the bond market going down. Uh, the Fed out of ammunition. I think we have like an 80% likelihood that the, that the recession's happening, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> a lot of what I put in the chat from Rana Fuhar, FT, just yeah. a great article, I'll read that. Okay. That will be my update for the economy. Uh, this, is, this thing is sort of a perfect storm, the way we've structured our healthcare system. This is a perfect storm to prove how ineffect, in, ineffectual and horrible this whole thing is. Uh, the biggest thing I'm concerned about are all these gig workers, all these service workers. You wouldn't believe how many people are cashiers in America. And the fact that most states don't even have a mandatory um, sick leave. I mean, yep. this is the perfect storm to hit us. Yep. I mean, the, the healthcare systems of like France and Britain are going to do great. I they're going to start. Contrast could, is not going to be more apparent. Yeah. I don't know about great, Bo. I think they're, gonna, they're, I think they're all going to struggle. Look, look, look at Italy right now. Um, but still, well, go ahead. The Italians are distinctly undisciplined individuals. <laughs> we just put the whole freaking country unlike, on lockdown. Unlike us. <laughs> um, so I'm just reading uh, I've, philosophy as usual. I'm into Hegel right now, the phenomenology of spirit. So like David and Jamez, I'll be home having a, looking out my window. Uh, I'm very happy to be at Portland. I think we're at a great, I love the, I think this town can handle just about anything and we'll handle it well. So much civility, so much, you know, I, I'm yeah. really going to be in Portland, but yeah. like, not this whole thing. Me too. Um, quick poll, uh, one to five, hold up fingers. If you think that we're going to be, that most major cities will be in a lockdown pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Like five means, yep, definite. One means, no, don't think so. Uh, lockdown means uh, companies, uh, all companies can't convene, uh, all meetings are canceled, schools are closed, uh, and people are encouraged to stay home, but not enforced. Like, you could still go shopping. Yeah, encouraged, whatever. but not enforced. Yeah, and exactly. Take it. That, that, that's my definition of lockdown. So, and pretty soon means next couple months. Is, so, is San Francisco already there? I don't know. So, well, Santa, so, Clara, I, Santa Clara just did it yesterday. Yeah. Todd, how many yeah. fingers are you holding up? Yours too close to the camera. Is that four or five? Santa Clara four. just did it, Susan? Really? Yeah. Five, five, four, five. Hey, Dave, are you holding your thumb out? I don't see your thumb. No thumb. Four. Good. Yeah. Well, they did some version of it, but it's it's fairly tight. Um, and uh, it forbade gatherings of more than some number of people. Um, again, voluntary. But yeah. um, what's interesting to me is the the governmental levels at which this is being decided. So yeah. cities are playing a big role. Yeah. You can get fined in Italy. Uh, that so it's it's different there. It's actually much more mandatory. Yeah. 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 So I Italy. Mean, oh, by the way, from an economic perspective, like tomorrow, we should be telling businesses, "Oh yeah, if you don't have the money for for sick leave, yeah, we're going to cover that." Uh, tomorrow, yeah. tests should be absolutely free tomorrow. And this is not my. Out. Yeah. yeah, this is not my opinion. This is The Economist, The Financial Times, or I had The Wall Street Journal, I don't know. But, but I mean, this is what we're all just terrified about. Like, yeah. this, our system is this perfect storm of, I'm sorry, you don't have the money for the test? What? <laughs> just, yeah, it's so ridiculous. This, this really is going to show the flaws of our shareholder capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, our health our for-profit healthcare system. And expertise. You find odd little things po poking up about um, some football player. Did you see that? It kind of went viral. Football, no. I mean, not player, uh, football. Uh, 
coach who, who said, look, I'm not, I'm, I shouldn't be saying, any, saying anything about the COVID virus. I'm not an expert. I don't know. You know, why don't we ask them? And it was like, okay, good. So May, you were going to say something? Oh, you know, the, um, the commentator Farad Manju uh, just recently said, uh, um, a pandemic makes everyone a socialist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bernie must be in tears. <laughs> yeah, the timing is terrible, right? Yeah. Timing is terrible no. for him. I, 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 look, I, I don't think Bernie would have made a very good president, but he's a, a terrific uh, propagandist. And um, his ideas are way more popular now than he is. So uh, him getting out of the way will let those ideas actually. Yeah, yeah he just announced he's not. I mean, literally in the last five minutes, he announced he's not getting out of the way. Of oh, interesting. Of course not. Yeah. So um, Mika, what's, what's, what's your hunch on what the Bernie's followers are going to do? How does that play out? Because the worst possible fate is that the yeah. Bernie people feel, feel that, that they all feel jilted yet again, that they feel that that the Democratic Party is against them in some organized way and that they all run over to Trump. Yeah. No. Well, thing, can I just point out one thing there that, that the dynamics of inside and outside yeah. are far more powerful than Democrat and Republican. Mm -hmm. And that's going to drive, that's going to drive it. Yeah. I'd, be, I'd be really worried if they actually voted. Pardon? I'd be really worried about them voting for Trump if they actually voted. Uh, I think most but of them. Apparently they don't. Most of hmm. them are going to vote for the Democrat the same way that last time around most of them voted for the Democrat. I think the third party threat uh, is going to be a lot smaller than it was Jill Stein or whoever the guy was who ran for the Libertarians, Gary, whatever. Um, and I think that the Democrats are going to be a hundred times smarter about investing in the swing states uh, compared to what Hillary did last time. Um, so I, I actually think, uh, you know, and I think also Biden... Uh, and the people around him are, are the people around him are pretty smart. Um, I would be surprised if they pick a Tim Kaine, you know, another old white guy. Um, and uh, so I think that uh, you know Trump uh, could win only because of those swing state problems that we we saw last time. Um, I saw the idea floated that Michelle Obama might be the Veep, which well, I would love. Which I would love. That's not a serious idea. No, she's no. not. Well, she said she's basically not in, not to, into the idea yeah. at all. She's not interested. She's I not. would totally love that. Well, of yeah. course, she's the most sensible member of that administration. Yeah, yeah. ain't gonna happen. Damn it! But I I think the problem of the dis you know the the, the angry Bernie bro, uh, you know Bernie or bust all of that shit. Uh, most of it is going to be dwarfed by uh, what's coming and the you know seeing the healthcare catastrophe. Yeah that's coming um, and you know people are going you know a lot of people are going to grow up um, in the next few months as they lose family members so I, I don't you know I do think the demand for uh, significant public health uh, investments is going to rise dramatically um, when even conservative members of Congress say that we should be paying for free testing yeah. like that so that's why I say, you know, his, he's not going to win, but his ideas very well uh, will. Um, and him getting out of the way would help. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Whenever Bernie even gets a sniffle, the stock market just goes crazy in happiness. They are yeah. terrified of Bernie. They are. Yeah, they, they are. They are. The smartest, the, the only signal we should be watching here. No, I'm not saying so, that. But yes. no, no. Yeah. So is any is any of us of the point of view that this is just going to blow over in a couple of weeks or a month and that we're, we're all going to be like, man, everybody was really panicked. Does anybody think that there's a there's a likelihood that in a, in a month, this is all just out of our minds and uh, just a, a bad blip and the markets back to chug, chug, chug? I wouldn't rule it out. I don't think it's very likely at all. Yeah. But I, I'm I try to be careful about making those kinds of definitive statements. Yeah, me too. Mika? I'm, I'm trying not to freak out is all I have to say. I'm really trying just not to freak out. <laughs> you look very calm, though. And your demeanor, your external demeanor is working just fine. Go ahead, Mika. I, I unfortunately have to jump, um, but so great to connect. And Jerry, do this more often. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate Good to see you, Mika. Glad, glad to have you here. And we're about to wrap. We're 10 minutes away from, from 
I, yeah, but I, I got another call in 10 minutes and I, I got to get ready for it. Go, go, go. Okay. I, See you later. Everybody be safe. And, and I didn't say that April is basically, has been on the road for three weeks uh, in Asia of all places. I don't know if you know, some of you follow her on Facebook or whatever, but she went to Malaysia to give a talk and some workshops when this was starting. Uh, then she went from there to uh, Singapore for a couple of days, from there to Hanoi, uh, from there to the Philippines, and she just la she's just about to land in, no, she is landed in Belgium. Uh, so she's in Brussels now, going to visit the little company called Nextworks that um, she's done some speeches for. Uh, they're very sweet in Ghent. And then she comes home this Saturday. And she's been as careful as she could be, although maybe not as careful as somebody more anal retentive would have been. I don't know. Um, and we'll see what happens. But she's, you know, coming home Saturday night. I, I was hoping she was going to be on the call. I mean, she must have some great insights about Asia, yeah. how they're handling it. So could you give us the briefing? Um, so it's funny, like in the Philippines, it was kind of life as usual in a lot of ways. And the Philippines was her most recent stop. And uh, people were aware, but not a lot of outdoor external activity was being shifted, changed or whatever. That said, the event she was going there for, basically, uh, people started canceling showing up. So it, it, it got downgraded and didn't happen. Um, but in, in the Philippines, not so much. In Hanoi, I think there was some, probably best to hear this from her next time. But um, uh, in Hanoi, there was some dent. But Hanoi is like a mo you know, scooter city. Like there's, there's insane scooter traffic everywhere. Scooters parked on all the sidewalks. And I'm not sure that that was being dented. Uh, so I think she's seen some wariness, uh, and there were, uh, some of her travel got shifted around, like they canceled her trip to Hanoi without, without telling her, so <laughs> she had to re she had to rebook and go through Saigon to get to Hanoi, blah, 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 but uh, there've been some inconveniences and a bunch of events being changed, but I don't know that the cultural stuff on the ground was that deeply affected. Um, and again, she didn't touched China, you know, so she didn't, didn't hit South Korea. So she wasn't in the places that have really, or Japan, that have really been affected and have, have changed everything. And Jerry, could you briefly summarize all the stuff that's been going on the Jerry's retreat email list? Like, what are the findings versus what the, uh, God, the if only media is talking about? So Pete Kaminsky put out kind of a COVID primer uh, a, a couple weeks ago, I guess. And that has, that has just been a thread that's just kept going and going and going as everybody keeps piling on what they're seeing, uh, the best videos, the resources over here and over there, a bunch of stuff going on. So it's, it's been really fruitful. Uh, I, I've been harvesting some of the links and putting them in my brain. Uh, so there's an Inside Jerry's Brain called this Friday at, I think, 10. I, I have to check again, but uh, I'm doing an Inside Jerry's Brain call about COVID and all this. Um, so if you want to catch up, join that call, uh, and we'll, we'll, you know, be more specific about it. Um, anybody else want to jump in about what, what's been on the list? I mean, what's cool on the list is that some of the people who are on the list are like social networking experts like Valdis Krebs, who's been sharing, here's, here's how contagion works. Look, here's some maps I did for CDC a couple years ago, um, and so forth. Todd, you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say it's interesting to see precautions that some people are taking, um, buying devices that that measure the amount of oxygen. Um, Pulse oximeters, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is Isabel asked uh, basically? Uh, so what are y'all doing? Like, what, what what mitigating strategies are each of you taking? And a bunch of people have written back saying, I'm not really stockpiling, but I'm like, you know, this. If on Sunday the markets are still open, I'm going to stockpile on Sunday, and and, and that kind of thing. I like that there was the uh, red, yellow, green uh, system that uh, <laughs> yeah, like Tom Munnicky was was labeling like the dog. The dog is green because the dog, you know, the dog is hostile to other dogs, so it's probably not a contagion vector. The grandkids were like yellow, I think. The grandkids are yellow, if not red. I mean, yeah. I think I think children are a huge contagion uh, vector here. Huge, huge, huge. I, I'm staying away from all parents, man. <laughs> no way. Um, cool. A any last thoughts before we wrap the call? Nope. Well, David oh. didn't check in. David didn't check in. 
Uh, Dave did a bit. I did, my, did, yeah. I did my, my GRC plug, yeah. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I get so, to track the uh, I get to track the cruise ship by watching the helicopters over the port. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, um, it's so you know it's swinging close to everybody in in different ways, and uh, so use the Rex list if you want um, for you know communicating more stuff about this as it goes. We'll we'll see how it uh, how it plays out. It's going to be interesting. We live in interesting times. Yeah, the curse has come true. Well, I hope to see the rest of you uh, in a month. <laughs> Me too. Hey, to me, me I was too. thinking of saying that, but I didn't want to do it because it's so dark. Oh, <laughs> oh, you, you, you just have to let Jamey do that. You knew he was going to jump in. Yeah. yeah. I, I, we should record Jamey's voice and make my startup sound on my Mac. <laughs> Doomed. <laughs> if you want Doomed. To get the, uh, my, my kid works for uh, Uber and he's having to, he's moving to work out of the New York office. And so his oh, mom wow. was like, Are you sure you want to do this? He's like, Yeah, mom, I'm going to New York. So oh, last wow. week he went to New York. But the, but the, fun, the fun little bit that he added on to it was that he took the Uber doctor from uh, Kennedy to, to Manhattan. To, Sweet. And then, and then the question is whether or not he'll be able to expense it. <laughs> expensive. Can we all take a solemn oath to take our iPads, phones um, with us to the ER and henceforth so we will all see each other? Excellent. Yep. And you know what? This is a non-contagious practice, what we're doing right here. So we're good. <laughs> You're making me okay. cough. That's oh, it's God. green. All right, gentle people. Thank you very, very much. Um, Ciao, babies. Ciao, babies. See you online.